joining us tonight. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Allison McGinnis, and I'm a social worker at the Day Program. We also have Tori Coleman here with us, who is our community health assessor. Uh, Tori is going to be helping out with question and answers and the chat function. Um, so before we introduce our um, presenters who are graciously joining us tonight, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we start. Um, we are using the webinar feature of Zoom tonight, so this is a little different than the normal Zoom platform that we use for our groups. Um, basically, it means that participants' cameras are off and your microphones are muted. So if you uh, could do a, a favor for us, that would be great. Um, if you are able to ensure uh, you can update your name, that would be great because we are taking attendance for tonight. Um, so if you could put in your first and last name, that would be very helpful for us. Um, a few uh, other functions I just want to let you know about. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you will likely see a little button that says Q&A. So that's where we're hoping that all of your questions could be typed in. Um, if you'd like to have a question submitted, um, that would be the, the best place for that to be typed out. Um, and there is an option for questions to be submitted anonymously. So before you um, press enter for that question to be submitted, there is a little box there that says anonymous. So if you don't want your name attached to the question. We are going to be addressing your questions as we go through the presentation. Um, and uh, there'll probably be time at the end if there's any further questions. Um, I also uh, wanted to let you know that there's a chat box as well, so you can message myself or Tori privately um, or the panelists, and that is just to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties and we can do our best to support you that way. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is that we are recording this webinar and we're posting it to our website, so you will uh, be able to access that later if you feel like you wanted to review it or if you wanted to pass it on to any family members or friends. So that's all for housekeeping items. Um, all right, so before, uh, so yeah, so the next item on my agenda is just to introduce our, our presenters here. So Trevor Murray has uh, joined us, who is the owner of the Beck Hearing Clinic uh, here in London, and also uh, Paula Dungavel, who is an audiologist. So I'm going to just turn it right over to you to get started. Thank you so much, Alison, and hello, everyone. It's so nice to see that there are 17 of you joining us tonight. Um, I love when people take an interest in hearing healthcare, uh, and and we love to to get out there and talk to the community. So this is fantastic. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I will launch right into the presentation if that's all right with everyone. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, hearing health and our brain. It's not where we starting. There we go. Um, can everyone? Oh, if you can't, I guess if you can't see the uh, presentation, maybe make a note of that in the chat, and we'll figure out what we're doing wrong. But um, looks like it's working on my end. Um, we do want to talk about hearing health and how hearing relates to our brain and uh, and our overall wellness. So what we will cover this evening is how do we process sound? So in essence, how do we hear? What causes us to lose our hearing? We'll talk a little bit about tinnitus and some of the comorbidities that are associated with hearing loss. And the main reason for tonight's um, presentation is how does hearing loss affect our cognitive function? And then we can talk about some of the ways that we treat hearing, hearing loss and, and what some of the outcomes are. And we can have a conversation after Q&A and anything that you wanted to clarify. So firstly, how do we process sound? Hopefully you can see the, uh, the diagram that we have here of the ear. So the ear is made up of basically three sections, the outer ear, which is the part that you can mostly sort of see and, and touch. And then the middle ear where you'll see the eardrum here in blue to the inner ear, which is where you'll see the purple elements, the cochlea, which is the, the organ of sound. So the way that we hear is sound waves are collected by the pinna, which is the sort of satellite dish part of our ear that sticks out of our head. And the waves are sent down that um, ear canal and they strike the eardrum, 
which causes vibration. So behind the eardrum, you'll see a chain of tiny little bones. These are called the ossicles. They're actually the smallest bones in our human body. Um, and so the vibrations travel along that chain into the cochlea where the cochlea is filled with fluid. And as you can see in that magnification on the diagram, these tiny hair cells. So the vibrations travel through the fluid to those hair cells where they're turned into an electrical signal and that is sent to the brain through the auditory nerve, which you can see sort of right to the, to the right of the cochlea there. So basically it's, a, it's movement and vibration through the, the whole process. So what happens if we lose our hearing? Well, something along the way is messing with that process, right? So there's a couple of different ways that we could have an issue with the hearing. The first part could happen in that middle ear to outer ear, and that would be a uh, conductive hearing loss. So there's physically something in the way that's blocking the sound from reaching the inner ear. It could be earwax. It could be a hole in the eardrum. Uh, it could be fluid or pressure in the middle ear there behind the eardrum. So that's conductive hearing loss. And that only really accounts for about 10% of hearing loss cases in adults. The main type of hearing loss that we see is called sensory neural. And that happens when the problem is in the inner ear. So that can happen. You, you see the, the hair cells there that we talked about. They bend and move as they receive the, the vibration of sound. Some of them, when they're bent right over and they're damaged, they'll never come back up. And that unfortunately is irreversible. And that is um, sensory neural hearing loss. Sometimes you can have a little bit of both and that's called mixed hearing loss. And in that case, you would treat the conductive hearing loss, which is usually done by either a medical treatment, you clear up an infection or you remove the wax. Uh, but that sensory neural element is treated with hearing aids. If it's a severe to profound hearing loss, it can be treated with cochlear implants that some of you may have seen. Um, and so that's how, we, that's how we treat hearing loss. Are there any questions on that before we move ahead? Um, there's nothing in the Q&A just yet. Yeah. So what causes that to happen? Obviously, there's a, there's a couple of different things. The most common is aging. As we age, we're all going to lose our hearing. It just happens at different points along the way for different people. Exposure to loud noise is a big one. And then, of course, there are medications, infections, if you have trauma to your ears or to your head. Uh, and some people are just born with defects that, um, that cause deafness or hearing loss. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter what the, <laughs> what the cause is. What matters most is that you're treating that hearing loss. I wanted to talk about tinnitus today because it is something that a lot of our clients uh, do suffer from. Uh, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. So what tinnitus is, or tinnitus, either way uh, that you pronounce it is fine. It's a ringing in your ears, or it can be a hissing, a buzzing. Some people hear music. And it's a sound that's generated in your brain. It's really not in your ears. Um, and it's and the, about 15% of the adult population suffers from tinnitus. Most of those, 15%, are older adults. So tinnitus can be caused, again, by exposure to loud noise, certain medications, uh, infections or trauma in the ear, earwax, some conditions and diseases, but 95% of tinnitus cases are accompanied by a hearing loss. So we can't say for sure that hearing loss causes tinnitus, but what we do notice is some people don't even realize that they have a hearing loss yet until they notice tinnitus and they come in for help. We do a hearing test, we find a hearing loss, and if you treat the hearing loss, with hearing aids, the tinnitus can subside. So I don't, Paula, do you wanna talk a little more about that or do you wanna just wait and see if there's any questions about it? Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, what happens a lot with tinnitus unfortunately is people will go to the doctor and the doctor will say, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's not entirely true. There's nothing the doctor can do. 
There's no surgery or drug. There's no cure for tinnitus. However, there are strategies to deal with it. And there is a sound enrichment um, process. There's therapy. There's other things that are available. So definitely, uh, if someone in your life suffers from tinnitus, have them see an audiologist. So, um, sorry, Trevor, yeah. there was one question just about, uh, it just says, I think you mentioned a medication earlier. Somebody was curious what medication that was. So there's a, there's a group of medications. They're called autotoxic drugs, which means toxic to the, the ear system. Uh, some of them uh, are, for example, some antidepressants, some cancer drugs, some blood pressure drugs. So there's quite a few of them. Uh, and the course of action isn't necessarily that you have to stop taking your antidepressants. We just have to look at which type you're taking and see if the doctor can suggest a different drug that does the same thing. Sometimes uh, people who take ibuprofen or naloxone daily, can, it can have an auto, uh, autotoxic effect. So again, the best thing is to have a list of your prescriptions and bring them to an audiologist and they will be able to tell you if any of the drugs that you're taking are autotoxic. Does that answer the question? Um, I believe so, yeah, thank you. If, okay. if a gentleman who asked that question needs more clarification, just let us know. Thanks so much. Perfect. Um, yeah, so comorbidities to hearing loss. Uh, there is a higher incidence of hearing loss in people who also experience kidney disease, cardiovascular conditions, diabetes, hypertension, thyroid disease, obesity, smoking, and more recently, of course, COVID-19. So if you think about some of these diseases having to do with oxygen levels in the blood, um, damage to soft tissues, etc., it just makes sense that if it's affecting one, it's affecting another system, right? So your hearing system uh, is, is affected by these conditions. And then hearing loss itself can cause an increase in things like falls or, or um, having balance issues and vertigo, depression and anxiety, tinnitus, as we've discussed. And of course, the main reason that we're here this evening, cognitive decline and dementia. I see there's a couple of questions. Do you want to go through them? Sure, be, yeah. Are, no, no, you... that's okay. No, that's a, so it's a, one question, and then there was just a correction of spelling there. So um, I think they were curious about what blood pressure drugs in particular. Paula, do you know off the top of your head which blood pressure drugs might be autotoxic? Um, not that they're autotoxic, but you can see it on the fine print uh, when you you know, get the pamphlet regarding the blood pressure medication that tinnitus may be a side effect. It's not a given that you will get it once you start taking that blood pressure medication, but it is one of the possibilities. So um, you may want to, if you're going to start a blood pressure medication or you're going to change it, you may want to check the possible side effects first. Um, sometimes it just has to do with the brand. Not all of them will um, have the tinnitus side effect, but certain brands are more likely to affect um, just that pathway. So tinnitus is a possibility. So it so will be it will be the fine print of the pamphlet. Just certain medication, the brands. Thank you. Welcome. So how does hearing loss affect our cognitive function? From a lifestyle standpoint, <clears throat> almost co a common sense standpoint, um, and if any of you have hearing loss, you can attest to this, as I can, uh, hearing loss can be very frustrating. And it can be embarrassing sometimes if you're in a social situation and you don't laugh at the joke or you laugh at something that wasn't a joke or you respond inappropriately to something or you're smiling and nodding and that's not the appropriate response because you missed half the conversation. So what happens is people with hearing loss will start to withdraw from those social situations and they'll 
they'll stop doing things that they used to enjoy in group settings, going to restaurants with the family, going to card night, whatever. And so what happens is they tend to just kind of want to stay home and stay by themselves, which we all know, you know, results in cognitive decline if you're not staying social and staying engaged. Um, another thing to think about is listening fatigue. So it's really hard to try so hard all day long to hear what's going on around you. And sometimes it's just easier not to. So you don't uh, engage in conversation, even if you are in a social situation. Maybe you don't listen to music as much anymore because it doesn't sound the way it used to. Uh, and so you're reducing the stimulus to your brain. From a physiological standpoint, and it's important to note that uh, there's a lot of research still going on. The exact link between hearing loss and dementia is still unclear. There's a lot of different hypotheses. Um, but what we do know is from looking at brain scans of people with hearing loss, uh, those who, who treat it with hearing aids and those who don't, um, we know that the underused portion of your brain or the auditory cortex that's not receiving the sound signals it used to uh, can become taken over by other sensory systems. So sometimes your visual system, your soma sensory, uh, somatosensory systems will take over that auditory cortex. And you can see this in the brain scan. The good news is that once that hearing loss is treated, um, it can be reversed. So some of the hypotheses in uh, research right now, can you guys hear that? That's the dog. <laughs> She's growling at the bone. Um, so sensory deprivation might be a factor. Um, I'm just gonna move this window out of the way so that I can read my notes. Um, so auditory stimulation and a variety of auditory stimulation is believed to be essential to a healthy superior temporal lobe, and that's a memory hub in the brain. Um, they also believe that certain neur neurons and pathways are shared um, between hearing and cognition. So if, if your hearing brain cells are understimulated, basically you're understimulating the cognition brain cells, they can atrophy and then of course accelerate the cognitive decline. And some people think obviously cognitive load, if you're working so hard, your brain is spending all of these resources on trying to hear, it's using up precious resources um, so other cognitive systems can suffer. So again, what we do know, uh, regardless of that causal relationship, uh, there have been several recent studies uh, and we can provide those if anybody's actually interested in, in the, um, the studies, one of them is the Lancet Commission that I would suggest everybody kind of look at. Um, but anyway, these recent studies have shown that preventing or treating hearing loss is the number one modifiable risk factor for dementia. And I have something to show you uh, on the next slide that'll kind of illustrate that a little bit better. Um, also, we know that people with hearing loss who are not treating it with hearing aids had a 42% higher risk of all-cause dementia than those who either didn't have hearing loss or did, but were treating it with hearing aids. So there's great news there that if you treat the hearing loss, your risk goes away. You have the same risk as somebody without hearing loss. Uh, and also, again, looking at the brain scans, treating hearing loss with hearing aids can slow and even reverse those physiological changes that are happening in the brain. So here's um, an interesting sort of diagram of dementia risk. And if you start at the very bottom to the right, you can see that 60% of the risk is unknown, but we think that 40% of the risk is potentially modifiable. So all along this sort of course of your life, you can see the different things that you can do to reduce the risk. And these percentages you see is how much percentage you can reduce the risk by altering that that factor and you'll see that hearing loss is the largest single chunk of any of the other um, activities at eight percent so even if you avoided brain injuries stopped drinking alcohol lost weight quit smoking you'd have to do all of those things together to have the same impact as simply preserving or treating loss of hearing 
So this is a really interesting um, illustration that one of the researchers sort of did. So what, what this is, what you're looking at is called an audiogram. And this is how we measure your hearing. So if you were to come into the clinic for a hearing assessment, we would plot what, what you're seeing in, in um, drawn in super neatly there in red and blue is my hearing plotted on the autogram. So across the top, you see the frequencies. So that's the sort of pitch of the sound, starting with bass at the left and going up to more, a more treble sound on the right. And then down the side is the intensity or the volume that that sound needs to be at in order for the person to hear it. So the red circles are my right ear and the blue X's are my left ear. If my, treat, my hearing loss was left untreated, you can see that I would be at a 390% increased risk of developing dementia over somebody who did not have hearing loss. Unfortunately, I do, I treat my hearing loss with hearing aids, so this doesn't affect me uh, in the same way as long as I wear them consistently. And the yellow lines that you'll see highlighted uh, were, are just to show you that that the top line, anything above that is considered normal hearing. And then the bottom line, anything below that is probably not treatable with hearing aids. You have to look at something like a cochlear implant. So in that middle area is where, um, where my hearing loss lies. And you can see the increased risk in the middle based on, on what your hearing loss is. So this is a really interesting way of looking at um, you could have a mild, a super mild hearing loss just below that yellow line and still be at, you know, 100% increased risk. So in terms of treatment for hearing loss, of course, if the hearing loss is conductive, we can remove the wax or clear up the infection. Um, there may be a surgery that removes one of the barriers to the sound reaching the, the inner ear. Uh, but again, like we discussed, that's only 10% of of hearing losses. For most hearing losses, hearing aids is the best treatment option. It's best for mild and moderate and into severe hearing loss. And then beyond that, severe to profound, cochlear implants are an option for some people. Uh, we also recommend auditory stimulation and sound enrichment. And that's especially if tinnitus is present. So hearing aids, which is, as I said, the treatment, uh, the, the main treatment for hearing loss are available in several different form factors, as you'll see here. Uh, and the one that's right for you, the one that Paula or another audiologist would recommend for you is based on several options, your lifestyle, what your needs are, what your budget is, what the anatomy of your ear is like, um, how much power you need because of how much hearing loss you have, et cetera. So, it's a very individual uh, prescription. And the, the girls at McCormick did ask me to talk about pricing because we know that it's a, it's a big deal when you're, when you're looking at hearing aids. Um, so I think it's important to note that the purchase price of hearing aids includes more than just the little devices. It includes all of your appointments. So your initial assessment, you get a physical exam, a recommendation, a fitting, at least one follow-up, but as many follow-ups as are required um, until you're comfortable with the device. Uh, adjustments, every six months we ask you to come in, and most clinics I'm sure ask you to come in for uh, a cleaning and an inspection of those devices, and then you get another hearing test annually so that we can keep track of any changes in your hearing and share that with your care team. So, Yes, hearing aids can range in cost between about $2,000 on the low end and 8,000. You could spend more than 8,000 on the high end if you wanted to. And that all depends on how much power is in the hearing aid, different features, the form factor, like we looked at on the previous slide, how tiny you want it, um, which accessories uh, you get with it and, and just how advanced the technology is. Most of our clients we see are well served with a hearing aid that costs between maybe four and $6,000. That's before um, ADP, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, or any insurance. So it often costs less than that out of your pocket. Uh, so like I said, hearing aids really are a significant investment, but with the proper care and maintenance, they should be lasting you about five to seven years. 
So the ADP I mentioned is the Ontario Ministry of Health's assistive devices program, and it covers up to $500 per side. It's about every three to five years, but there's a lot of factors in there. It depends on how your hearing changes and, and uh, the shape of the hearing aid. If you're on ODSP, they will cover the cost of hearing aids for you. If you're a veteran, they will cover the cost of, of the hearing aids. WSIB, so if the hearing loss is shown to be noise induced and can be connected to a workplace, um, a history of noise in the workplace, then, then the Workplace Safety Insurance Board will cover the cost of the hearing aids. Um, and then for people who are on uh, a very low income, there is help from Ontario Works and Discretionary Benefits. It's a pretty low income. Those are pretty hard to get, but it's always an option. And then of course, um, private insurance and benefits plans. Some of them cover audiology, some of them don't. It, it's a range of, of dollar amounts as well. Uh, and then of course, most uh, independent clinics anyway will offer you layaway options or financing. And we've even seen some uh, leasing models. So you don't own the hearing aid, you lease it for three years and then you trade it in for the next technology level and you continue to lease it on a monthly basis. So I think in summary, what I hope everyone sort of takes away tonight is there are several causes of hearing loss. Aging and noise exposure are really the most common. Untreated hearing loss increases the risk of falls, depression, cognitive decline, and dementia. And I'll just remind you kind of our big stat is that hearing loss is the number one modifiable risk factor for dementia. Our brains need varied and consistent auditory stimulation to remain healthy and prevent atrophy. And that's the end. Does anybody have, oh, there's one question in the chat. Wonderful, yeah, no, thank you for that. That was a great presentation. Yeah, we do have one question here and um... I encourage everybody in our audience to uh, go ahead and type into the Q&A box there if you have any any other questions about the information that was presented to us. Um, or if you have questions about, you know, your hearing aids and maybe troubles that, that you have at home and um, if you are looking for some uh, pro tips or whatnot, that would be uh, an, another appropriate type of question. So the one we've got here, so it says, can you describe or illustrate with the diagram of the ear on the earlier slide what the hearing aid is doing or how it works in the ear? And then, yeah, we'll get that one first. <laughs> Paula, do you want to do this? Sure. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> very good question. Thank you, Joanne. And so we know that sound, sounds are actually vibrations in the air. So when people actually cup their hands over their ears and they say, oh, I hear better, that's actually working because you're channeling or funneling more vibrations into your ear canal. Now, when you're hearing loss, um, whether it's conductive or sensory neural, it doesn't really matter what type of hearing loss you have. When we measure it, when we uh, have an audiogram, so the hearing loss is broken down into the different frequencies. What the hearing aid does is it makes sure that the sound it's picking up. So the hearing aid, whether it's sitting inside your ear canal or behind your ear, what it does is it picks up the sound or the vibrations in the environment and amplifies the sound to be loud enough that your hearing threshold, the one that we have measured on the audiogram, your threshold is able to meet the amplified sound. So normal hearing is anywhere between 0 to 25 dB across the different frequencies. And let's say you have a flat hearing loss of 60 dB. What the hearing aid does is it picks up this sound Let's say in the environment, the sound is only 40 dB, but your hearing threshold is 60. The hearing aid will convert the 40 and add 20 and makes sure that the sound going into your ear is 60 
that it will be loud enough for your cochlea, the end hearing organ, to pick it up. That's basically a simplified um, answer to your question, Joanne. Um, you can type another question if that wasn't uh, very clear. But basically, a hearing aid is an amplifier. It amplifies appropriately the sound that is speaking in the environment to make sure that you can hear it. The difference between a hearing aid and an amplifier that you can just buy off the internet or something is a hearing aid um, is a digital device that makes sure that the quality of sound you're hearing is somewhat tailor-made to your hearing loss because most hearing losses are not flat. Each, it's like you have an internal equalizer. The hearing aid will make sure that your equalizer is set to the most optimal that it sounds natural to you. And there will be no danger of over amplifying that can further worsen your hearing. So that's what it does. Um, just on that note, since you mentioned the hearing devices that you can purchase off of various, you know, platforms or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, so can you elaborate a little bit on the difference there with the, with those? Um, so the, the ones that you can purchase off the internet, I know there are different kinds. We call them OTCs, like over the counter, and some of them, they will be accompanied by some sort of app that you can use to measure your own hearing and then be able to somewhat program the amplifier on your own. Um, the danger to that is first, when you're measuring your hearing, you have to make sure it's very, very quiet so you have an accurate reading so that when you program, self-program the amplifier, it's not going to give you more than you need. Because if you are over amplifying and then it is exceeding what we would consider safe limits, then it will worsen the hearing and then become a noise-induced hearing loss. And when we, when we lose our hearing, we know that it's irreversible. So um, we have to be careful when we're buying over-the-counter hearing aids that first there's some sort of a, a limit point, a limiting um, processor that it's never going to exceed safe limits. So basically an amplifier, it's not as um, what we can call, cannot be as customized to the person, to the hearing loss as what the hearing aid is. A hearing aid is a prescription. It's a prescribed device over an amplifier, which is somewhat that you can just buy off the shelf. Okay. I think um, if I can add to Allison, I think it's important to note that um, OTCs or amplifiers are not regulated federally by Health Canada. And I think that that in itself can, can pose a danger. So hearing aids are regulated. Um, and they, if OTCs ever do legally come to Canada, they will be obviously. They won't. They won't be available for sale here until they are. But at this point, they're only legal for sale in the states because they are regulated and approved by the FDA. Okay, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, next question, just going in order here, um, is about vertigo. So, can you describe or illustrate what vertigo is and what it is affecting? Um, vertigo is vestibular imbalance. Um, in the illustration here, the purple area, if you'll see that picture where it looks like a cinnamon, well, overall, it looks like a snail. So the cinnamon area, that one there, that's the cochlea, that's your hearing organ. And if you look on somewhat the top side where it looks like the head of the snail, that's your vestibular organ. Um, that is basically what's um, telling the brain the position of the body without seeing. So those three rings, at each end of those rings, there's little sacs. And in those sacs, there's otoliths. Some people would call them crystals or rocks. Mm -hmm. They look like them. And those otoliths are very specific to each sac. 
When we move our head, it's also fluid filled. When we move our head, the rocks move and they send a signal to the brain, in, uh, informing the brain of our body orientation. Uh, sometimes when we move our head too quick, when even when we go to the salon and you know have our hair washed, um, accidentally some of the rocks may be displaced and now every time they move they're in the wrong spot and they're sending the wrong signal to the brain. The brain is getting confused because the signals it's receiving from our eyes, again informing of body orientation, does not correlate to what the rocks are sending it. So you you feel dizzy as long as the rocks are not too much they should dissolve in the fluid but if there's a significant amount that was displaced then you have to get yourself to um, ear nose and throat specialist or a professional some audiologists would do it and they would do specific maneuvers to put the rocks back in place um, that's just, that's called a positional vertigo, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. That's the most common uh, vertigo. But if there's any inflammation on the cochlea, sometimes because of that inflammation, there's pressure and then it's affecting the balance organ because they're so close together. Um, there's many, there's many, um, what do you call this? There may, there, there may be many factors as to what is causing the vertigo. There's also the central vertigo where it's more um, the nerves that are affected. There's certain tests that can diagnose as to what kind of or what's causing your vertigo. So it's best to again see a professional, consult with your doctor so then you can get the proper assessment and then lead to a proper treatment. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, I've got another question here. If someone has ruptured an eardrum, what can be done to help them? Uh, okay, so the eardrum is actually, you can consider that as our gateway to the brain. So as much as possible, if there's a hole on the eardrum, we want to seal it. We don't uh, want to risk any microorganism getting past the eardrum. And so we would... The first course of action would be to see uh, your medical doctor, your physician, to possibly maybe get it patched or surgically um, repaired by an otolaryngologist or an ENT. Um, if there are cases where if the ruptured eardrum is causing significant hearing loss or affecting um, communicative function, and we receive medical clearance from the family doctor, we can go ahead and proceed with the hearing aid. Okay, great. Um, just a question about your service at back. Uh, is your initial appointment uh, free if you do not require a hearing aid? So the, the initial assessment is always free for adults, 18 plus. Uh, it's a little bit different with, with kids. There's a fee for that, but um, you're welcome to come back every year for a free hearing test. We really just want everybody to be tested. And if it's normal, uh, we'll tell you that it's normal. And we want to see you in two years, five years, depending on your age, depending on what, um, what the specialists see on the, on the test. And come back when you want, and it's free again. And and Paula's advice is free, and it's priceless. Um, so yeah, anytime anyone has questions at all about their hearing or hearing healthcare or uh, earwax or anything like that, um, we're happy to do a free hearing assessment and a free consultation. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, next question here. Where can we find more information regarding hearing loss being the number one modifiable risk factor? And then there's a second part. So where can we find the slide which showed the increased risk for dementia based on hearing loss? So I can answer the second part. Um, if you are looking for that slide, uh, you could send me your email address and I can send you the slides um, that were uh, shown today. Um, so and what I can that. do too, Allison, I can send you the source information for those because that's probably what um, they're asking for is the studies or the articles that, that I 
took those from. Perfect. Uh, I can send you a bunch of links that are really interesting. Oh, there she is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Here's my three-year-old saying good night. Good night. <laughs> she found me. Good night, Zora. Good night. Good night. Okay, okay mommy has to take happy birthday. <laughs> I knew it would happen. Special um, guest appearance, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Allison, I can send you the the links to the research um, so that people can kind of read further on their own. That's great. Really, that would be wonderful. Yeah, and I can send that out tomorrow with our um, webinar evaluation. So that's perfect. Okay. And I, was there a second part to that question? The first, um, oh, right, yeah, all that information will be sent out, perfect. Okay, another one here. What would you suggest for some, oh, this is a, definitely a lot of people wanna know this. What would you suggest for someone who doesn't wear their hearing aids because they say, I quote, don't work and they're frustrated with them? <laughs> I would suggest, so, and as frustrating, it is frustrating, and it takes a long time to get used to them. Uh, the brain does need to get used to hearing all of that sound again, and, and that can be hard at first. This sounds like a, an experienced user, but just in general, it does take some time. Uh, I would suggest wearing them for a few hours a day, increasingly more as you go until um, you can get used to them, but also go back to the audiologist that that fit those hearing aids for you uh, and explain which parts of it aren't working for you and go back as many times as you have to until they get it right because you paid probably six thousand dollars or whatever for a pair of hearing aids uh, you need to be wearing them so it's something that we sort of take a pretty hard line on you need to consistently wear the hearing aids and and if there's a reason you're not if it's physically not comfortable in your ear um you know let us try to fix that or or take it back and and have them try to fix that if it's the sound that you need adjusted bring it back and ask them to adjust it and uh, i mean any clinic should be happy to do it as many times as it takes because everybody wants you to be wearing them may i just add um with hearing aid use we know that you have to wear them regularly every day and based on scientific research and um, testing, it, you have to wear it consistently five to six hours a day and it would take about six months for you to realize the full benefit of it. The hearing loss was a gradual change and when you put the hearing aid in, it's not like a light switch that would just work immediately. So the system, your, your, your nervous system has to recognize that, oh, there is some input, there is some signal happening. We need to activate different parts of the brain again. And it's like a muscle that you need to exercise, you know, stretch, warm up, and then you realize that, oh, it can take more, work and by the end of the six months you're you don't consider it work anymore it becomes a part of you so it is frustrating at first but you just have to get over that hump over that hill and then hopefully as long as it's properly programmed and properly selected for you and your needs um it should it should work we know that it will work and you have to let the provider know any issues that you're having because if they don't know they they won't know how to to resolve the problem so just assume that they can do something about it and then take it from there don't give up <laughs> thank you okay next question here most people i know that have hearing aids do not wear them the experience they say is that it picks up other sound and amplifies them. Is there a way to control that? Yes, especially with the new hearing aids. They come with um, different apps, different accessories. We have to remember also that the hearing aids, they are not, um, they're amplifiers. If the sound is audible to somebody beside you or it, you should hear it too. But we know that it gets a little bit overwhelming when you're hearing everything all at once. So there are features in the hearing aids that 
you can control yourself. There are features of hearing aids that are a little bit more advanced that can do it automatically for you. So when you are selecting a hearing aid, you have to let the person, your provider, your clinician know about your concerns, what your difficulties are, the situations that you are most frustrated in because there are certain hearing aids that will be more suitable for, for, for what, you're, what you need it for, what your main objective to getting the hearing aids. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, next question here is, I wear hearing aids that were provided through a WSIB claim, and I was shocked by the resulting improvement to my hearing. The newer hearing aids are very programmable, pro programmable by the provider and help to improve the hearing at certain frequencies. Also, if you have a smart TV, you can also pair your hearing aids to the TV audio. So this is a real game changer for me. Mm -hmm. So that's great. That's uh, So, and even, Allison, even if uh, you don't have a smart TV, there's an accessory that's available uh, that is like a go-between. It's a TV box that connects to your TV and transmits that audio via Bluetooth to your hearing aids. So if you are in a household with other people and you don't want to have to turn the TV up loud, you don't have to. It's it's being streamed directly into your hearing aids and everyone else can listen at a comfortable level. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, next question here is, uh, could you recommend a best way to remove earwax? Best way to remove earwax? Um, depending on how active your wax glands are and how active they are has to do largely with genetics. So if it, the earwax is not getting to a point that it's blocking your eardrum and affecting hearing, we really shouldn't be removing it ourselves. The ear canal will remove it by itself. The skin will move outwards and you the excess or old wax you can reach eventually with just your pinky. So when they say use a washcloth and wipe the outside of the ears, that's the best way because you're not going to potentially push the wax back in. But there are some people who, because of their genetics, um, the earwax is very active that before the skin is able to push it out, it's accumulated so much that it's blocking the eardrum and causing hearing loss. What we do there is we flush. As long as the eardrum is intact, there's no ruptured eardrum. We can flush uh, with water. We do that at our clinic. And um, if you just want to maintain um, earwax at a manageable level, you can put one to two drops of olive oil one to two times a month, um, as long as the ear canal and, sorry, the eardrum is intact, no risk there before bedtime. Keeps the wax so soft that it's just gonna come out on its own. Okay, perfect. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of different uh, theories out there how to remove your wax. So. <laughs> Great to hear it from an audiologist. <laughs> All right. Okay, so another question that a lot of our, our audience members are probably curious about is, um, have you worked with dementia patients before, people who are living with dementia, and how difficult is it uh, to fit a person? It's um, not very difficult, as long as there is a very good support group. We have clients who have dementia, uh, typically, they will be accompanied by a family member, sometimes even a friend. And uh, there are hearing aids wherein you don't have to remember to put the battery in anymore. There are rechargeable hearing aids. And usually, I don't know with you, Trevor, but usually they will almost like muscle memory remember how to put their hearing aids in, how to take them out at night. And the problem before was before the advent of rechargeable hearing aids, they would just be putting their hearing aids in and the battery's dead or there's no battery in it. Uh, but now there are rechargeable hearing aids where you just put it on a charger, it's magnetic even, and when they put the hearing aids in, no question, the hearing aid will be working. 
So the hard part, I feel like if the person has already has dementia already prior to um, the hearing aid use is getting a very accurate audiogram that makes it more customized for, for their hearing loss. But as long as we get some thresholds and they're pretty accurate and you will, you will already see anyway when you fit the hearing aid that they are coming alive, their eyes are brighter and they're answering um, yes or no questions that the hearing aid is working. So it's not very difficult as long as the person, the clinician is experienced in uh, ways to get accurate results from, from the patient, the client. Okay, great. And um, I know too, I, I've heard a lot of uh, care partners talk to us about um, losing the hearing aids often um, and just wondered, uh, somebody mentioned to me that there's different colors out there so it, it would stand out in a garbage can and I don't know any other tips that you can um, provide uh, in terms of making sure that people are able to keep track of where they are it would be great. So there's different kinds of hearing aids. Uh, the behind the ear ones, what we do is we suggest to the family if they bring up that concern of losing the hearing aids. Uh, clips. So they, they're little strings that go around the hearing aid. And then you have to, at the end of each, not, they're attached and there's a little clip that you put on the client's or the user's shirt so that if they fall out, they're just dangling there. Um, same thing for the ones that are customized, just sitting in the ear. We would have the hearing aid company put a loop on that we can attach those strings so that you can again, just clip it on the shirt. So that in the event that they knock it out, it's just gonna hang on their shirt. Um, we service some retirement homes and the caregivers are so good, what they would suggest to us or what they've been doing, they would share that at night they would take the hearing aids and just keep it in the nurse's station and in the morning and charge them or replace the battery every week. And in the morning, they would be the ones to be putting the hearing aids in because sometimes if they leave it in the room, they said sometimes it rolls under the bed or and they, they lose it. So that's typically what's happening in the retirement homes, as long as they have the, the permission or instruction from the family members. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, good segue into the next question here. So okay. do, you, <laughs> do you know um, if there are any hearing clinics or audiologists that go into long-term care homes regularly to assess the residents? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you, you're able to go into long-term care. Um, it, the family members request for us to come over and some do a hearing test if they suspect that the hearing has changed. So the hearing aids are programmable. If the hearing has gotten worse, doesn't mean they have to buy a whole new hearing aid. We just have to reprogram the hearing aids to the new hearing loss. So we can do hearing tests. Uh, we do maintenance as long as the family members again request for us to come over and do the service for them. So yes, we do home visits. We visit long-term care homes and retirement homes. That's great. That's really handy for people who maybe have some mobility challenges, can't get out. That's great. There is a question here in the chat box too. So um, is there a way to tell if there is fluid behind a person's eardrum? Yes. So sometimes you can actually see it when you look in the ear. There's bubbles behind the eardrum and that's an indication of fluid buildup behind the eardrum. However, if there's not much, we have to do, um, we call it tympanometry. We have a specific machine that would measure how well the eardrum is moving. And behind the eardrum, the middle ear cavity is just air filled. If there's any fluid there, there will be limited motion by the eardrum. And we would, I mean, not us, but the machine would be able to pick it up. The, the results will indicate if there's any fluid buildup or whatnot behind the eardrum. Okay, great. 
And is it common for hearing aids to hurt in your ear when you start to wear them? No, <laughs> it shouldn't hurt. Um, if it is hurting, it might be causing some pressure on a certain sensitive spot. We can grind it down, whether it's a, a custom aid or an ear mold, or change if it's a dome, the little just plastic piece that we use. There's different sizes, different shapes, so it shouldn't hurt. Okay, great. Um, and I think you answered this one about the Q-tips, um, fact or fiction, or cleaning. <laughs> so, okay. And then... Uh, yes, our... Brian, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then our last one here, unless anyone else has any more that they'd like to add to the question and answer box, is what type of hearing aid can you get, a, get for around $2,500? any type of hearing aid. So some people have this misconception that the more discreet or the smaller the hearing aid, the more expensive it is. Um, no. So what you're actually paying for is the type of microchip that they put in the hearing aid, but you can get a custom-made hearing aid that goes right in your ear like a little pill. You can get ones that go behind the ear with a tubing, you can get ones behind the ear that are rechargeable for that amount. So it would depend on the technology level, but definitely 2,500, you can get whatever style you would like that is suitable for your hearing loss. And again, that decision is made by yourself and your audiologist who will you know, recommend depending on what your needs are and expectations, um, what sort of the best hearing aid would be for you. All right, wonderful. Is there any other comments that you have to add, Trevor, or is, uh, any other questions out there from the audience? Um, no, I just, I wanna thank everyone for the questions. I always find that the most valuable part of these oh, presentations. So oh, there's one more. There is? Yeah. It is. It's really nice. And it's nice to hear, you know, people well, have questions I find that everybody can hear. We, <laughs> yeah. And when we start, uh, you know, we answer one question. And so we kind of start talking about something that might jog something for somebody and then they think of a question. Right. And so we end up, you know, really having a great conversation at the end of these things. And I, I love it. That helps us to know what to talk about next time as well and, and kind of anticipate what everybody's needs are. Exactly. Okay, so our another question here that's just popped up, it says, if the person isn't able to signal when they hear the sounds um, made with the testing or is nonverbal, how would you work with them to complete the testing? Oh, Joanne, we do for that type of um, situation, we would do sound field testing wherein the person would sit in the booth and we would emit sounds through speakers that are built into our soundproof booth and they will localize. So the speakers are right and left. We would sometimes use pure tones like beeps or noise, depending on what type of signal that they are most receptive to. Mm. And you see them looking to where the sound is coming from. And if they, are, they have good localization and they're able to look to the right or left speaker, depending on what, which one we are using, we can say that they have balanced hearing. Sometimes when we, let's say, give a sound to the left speaker and they look to the right, we know that the right ear is their better ear because the better ear will always respond. And then we do sound field testing. We're able to do threshold. Um, we can establish threshold because slowly we're lowering the sound. And you'll see them no longer responding because they're no longer hearing the sound. Sometimes even they don't have to turn their head. Sometimes you'll just see their eyes, you know, open a little wider or just, just um, body cues that they can, they can actually, oh, what's that? Um, alert to the sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, thank That's you very much. That's how we test babies also. Sometimes okay. the moms would 
bring them in the booth and when they're very young, we'll start by feeding them. When we present the sound, they stop sucking. Uh -huh. And when the sound is gone, they start feeding again. So um, they respond in many different ways. You have to be very attentive, I'm sure, in your job. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, Excellent. Well, this has been great. I've learned so much and uh, it's very, very interesting and um, just uh, happy to know about all of this because, I, you know, you've proved the point there how important our hearing is and, um, you know, we want to make sure everybody gets the, the support that they need to improve their hearing. So thank you very, very, very much, Treva and Paula, for joining us tonight Welcome. and for sharing all this wealth of knowledge.